The following podcast was recorded on Friday, December 2nd, 2022, featuring Sam Rines of Arbor Data Science. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome everyone to the latest edition of Talking Data. I'm your host, Kristen Radish with Arbor Research and Trading, joined today by Sam Rines of Arbor Data Science. Good morning, Sam. Good morning, Kristen. Today, Sam discusses the nature of the catastrophe bond market. Sam, Florida is just recovering from the lashing of Hurricane Ian. There's also tornadoes hitting the southern part of the country. And when tragedy strikes, it can be existential for insurance and reinsurance companies due to the potential excess losses. But there was a product designed to absorb the losses. Today, let's talk about cat bonds. What what makes these bonds so intriguing? What are the benefits? Well, there's there's it's a really interesting market. I mean, it's you know it's fairly it's a fairly new market. You, you know, it's only been around for 25, 30 years, something like that. And, you know, but it's but it's been maturing more recently, uh, and you know to a certain degree it's it's been growing. But the interesting thing about catastrophe bonds is kind of two sided. One, they tend to pay a higher interest rate, you know, almost like a high yield type interest rate, um, and they're completely uncorrelated to market events. Right, you're you're you are mostly, unless you have rising interest rates like we do now. Uh, but the outcome of the bond is typically much more correlated with uh, some sort of natural disaster and the potential there uh, than it is to market events, right? You're not, you're not really correlated to an equity market and you're not as correlated to interest rates because really what you're looking for is the bond to pay out at the end. So it's, it's incredibly interesting from a number of levels. Uh, there's, there's, mortality, excess mortality type bonds um, that could get a little hairy in a situation like a COVID-19 um, where you know, you're know you going to have more than likely some over mortality rates. Uh, there's also an interesting perspective for uh, uh, Caribbean island governments that might be seeing the effects of uh, more hurricanes happening. Uh, Jamaica has issued catastrophe bonds in the past uh, to help absorb some of their potential losses and rebuilding efforts following hurricanes and other natural disasters. Uh, so it's it's a market that is really intriguing for somebody that is looking for yield but doesn't really want to have uh, traditional market exposure. What's been forgotten about these bonds? Oh, so many things. Uh, so many things. It, it's it's interesting. In a rising rate environment, all of a sudden, those higher yields really aren't that intriguing, uh, unless you can, you know, get the bond for a lower price in the secondary market. It, it's it's also been somewhat forgotten that when you have inflation, uh, these bonds get a little these bonds get a little interesting. Uh, most of them have triggers related to aggregate losses. Uh, so you're talking, you know, just using an example, uh, if you have 500 million in losses, the next 100 million uh, or 200 million are absorbed by the catastrophe bond. Uh, so, you know, up to 500 million in losses for a place like Florida, you're all set. If you have that extra two or 300 million in losses, the bond gets wiped out. Right, all of a sudden you you have nothing. You get uh, zero. Uh, that's That's really kind of interesting. When you think about most of these bonds are tied to property and casualty insurance, and you know PNC tends to be something like a house and something like a car, two asset prices that have risen rather dramatically since COVID. That's that's something to kind of keep in the back of our heads here. That if you have used auto prices up 30 or 40 percent, that's a pretty significant increase in the potential losses for insurance companies and the potential call it downside for these bonds. That's, that I think has been somewhat forgotten here that unless you begin to have a significant downtrend in inflation, you could have these catastrophes add up much more quickly. Would you describe that as the biggest threat to this market? Oh, it's, it's it, probably in, in the near term, it's, it's somewhat of a threat and I think it's somewhat uh, forgotten. Uh, if you have 
uh, and you know, a storm in Florida. We saw the flooding of the cars. You know, the Teslas that uh, looked fine, but then the corrosion from seawater uh, caused them to light on fire. You know, those are those auto losses add up very, very quickly. That you know, and they put the bonds at zero if you go over the limit. So if you all of a sudden had a calculation of eh, maybe inflation's two or three percent, and all of a sudden you know, your inflation is running at 10 or 15% for used autos and shelter, you know, that, that, that could become a fairly significant issue very, very quickly. Most of these bonds have a life of three to five-ish years. Uh, so those will reset eventually. And I think that's going to be really interesting on the loss front to see how these bonds begin to be uh, priced when, they come, when people return to the market. And how do you think these bonds might become very attractive again? Mm, uh, so, Two things. One, inflation begins to slow again, and you have a less aggressive Fed, but you have a higher initial starting interest rate. So if, if your Fed funds is at five percent, um, you know these, you know, a catastrophe bond coming to market should be in the eight to ten percent type interest rate range. And if you have cooling inflation on the other side, maybe your potential losses aren't necessarily as bad as they could have been in 21 or 22. So you could have some interesting dynamics on new issues as we go into 23 and 24, and they could potentially have some pretty significant upside, uh, assuming that you know you pick a broad basket and you don't get you know some sort of trigger hit. That that obviously could lead to a zero. Um, but you know, there's there's some interesting ways that the interplay between uh, Federal Reserve pausing at five to five and a half percent and slowing inflation could really make these bonds attractive to investors again. And what is the size of this market? How big is it? Uh, it's it's not huge. It, it's it's nowhere near you know what you know. It's not a mortgage backed security market. Uh, it's you know it's probably closer to call it 25 to 40-ish billion. It's kind of hard to get a read on it. A lot of these are private. You know, it's, it's hard to get the data on the overall size of the market. Uh, but you do have, you know, you do have people coming to market with these still, you know, nowhere near the size that we saw several years ago. Uh, but you do have, you know, some issuance happening in the market. Uh, I would say that that's probably likely to pick up uh, next year when interest rates begin to stabilize potentially. And how long has this market been around? Yeah, it's been around since, uh, call it the late 80s, uh, but not in significant size. You know, it really began to pick up uh, in terms of its issuance call it in the early 2000s. Uh, so you're talking 20 years as a semi-mature market. Sam, in summary today, what should we be watching for next? Particularly on this, I think it's, it's two-sided. One, you really want to be paying attention to who's issuing and what they're issuing about, uh, right? There's a lot of different triggers that these bonds have. Some are, you know, if, uh, you know, if Texas has a freeze and it lasts more than three days, the bond pays out. You know, there's very specific triggers like that. Uh, I would I would be paying attention to how issuers deal with the problem of inflated asset prices that they're insuring and how they begin to bring those to market in an efficient way. Sam, thank you for your thoughts today and thank you everyone for joining us. If you have any questions on Arbor Research, Arbor Data Science, or Bianco Research, you can contact us by emailing Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Thanks everyone. Have a great day.